All right. Hello, everybody. Once again, welcome to another episode of the Remarkable Coach Podcast. I'm your host, Michael Pacheco, and today with me, I have Michael King. Uh, Michael is the founder and CEO of Teams.Coach LLC. He's a highly sought after business and executive leadership coach. Uh, he helps business leaders clarify and execute at high levels through his proprietary TEAMS, Teams methodology, to develop measurable business growth and company-wide collaboration. Uh, Michael King, welcome to the podcast. Thank you so much, Michael. How are you? I'm doing wonderful, man. It's good to have you here. Thank you so much. I always like to kick off the, the, the pod by just uh, inviting our guest to tell us a little bit about yourself um, and what got you into coaching. Yeah, absolutely. I tell people this all the time that, uh, that you don't really necessarily choose coaching. Coaching kind of chooses you. Um, I come from basically about, uh, you know, a couple decades of being, um, being in pastoral ministry, uh, two decades, roughly, uh, being an executive pastor, of a, a large, um, you know, evangelical megachurch type organization, multi-site, uh, while I was in this, in that space, um, had the opportunity to run alongside some pretty high capacity leaders, build some pretty powerful things, build great systems and people systems, all those things, uh, became a, a little bit more of a bigger influence outside of the reach of the local church than I was actually inside uh, eventually, mm -hmm. um, went on an exploration somewhere around 2015 to, uh, finish out my master's degree in, in leadership and executive coaching and, um, and started to discover that maybe my biggest impact moments would be the ones that were outside of the, of the church. And I'm so glad that I had that aha moment. Um, so teams.coach was born. And the next thing you know, we're, um, we are doing incredibly well. In fact, during COVID, we've actually tripled the size of our organization and, uh, we get a chance to work with anywhere from fortune 500 to fortune 50 companies, entrepreneurs, um, in the, in the business and enterprise space. And we do some, some stuff as well at church leaders as well, but, um, seeing vision come to life, like it never has before and healthy teams performing like they never have before has been just an absolute passion of mine. And it's a, it's a blast. I love it, brother. And I want to clarify for our viewers and listeners, teams.coach is the website, right? Dot coach is the TLD. I think it's probably a, a, a top level domain that many people are not familiar with, but it's basically your dot com, teams.coach. Yep, that's right. It's the name of my company and it's the name of our domain because we're fancy like that. That's I love it. just 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 kidding. <laughs> no, I get it, man. We got we got boxer.agency, so we are also fancy like that. <laughs> <laughs> awesome we're, we're 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 twinsings except for our names are spelled a little bit differently but that's all right i love it i love it it's the, the michael and michael show um so you were a pastor that's awesome i know you were on also you were on our, our sister podcast coffee with coaches and you yeah spoke to kevin there did, did you and kevin get into that at all because i know kevin for years and years he was um he was doing i don't know if he was a, i think he was a youth pastor but he was big into into the church and, and into leadership and stuff in there I, we touched on it lightly, but as you know, with that, with the, with the format of that show, it's, it was, it was pretty quick in and out. We talked about my team's methodology, uh, I think a little bit, but, yeah. um, but yeah, so not much. Right on. And you have a master's in leadership and executive coaching. I was unaware that that is a degree that you could, that someone could get. True story. Yeah. So I, I, I graduated from Bellevue university, uh, with my degree in, in organizational leadership and executive coaching. And, I didn't necessarily, I didn't necessarily know, like I went back to school to get my degree in organizational leadership because I was experiencing some pain points within, within the church and within the organizations that I was serving to where I thought maybe I might be going a little bit crazy here and I needed some more tools in my toolbox just to help me, you know, get through um, a season of leadership. So I went back to finish, finish out my master's and um, the last year um, I was, I was ahead of, of where I needed to be at. And so I had some options as far as some different things I could take. And sure enough, had some great conversations with some people there and they offered a, a, a master's in uh, executive coaching. And I'm like, you know what, I think I'm already doing this. And so I think I'm going to go ahead and give this a shot and see what happens. And I'm so glad that I did. It was uh, it was a brilliant experience for me. That's awesome. I, yeah, that's like, I mean, I think, I feel like a lot of coaches will get like, you know, an ICF certification or something like that, but probably my guess is that wouldn't quite compare to a four-year focused degree on executive coaching. 
Yeah, my thing was is that is in, in it's a little bit of a pet, it's a kind of a small pet peeve. And so I don't mean to offend any listeners or anything like that. But oh. what I found was that in, you know, like in pastoral world, um, or even in leadership world, what I keep on finding is I'm speaking at conferences and traveling and, and all this, all these other things that um, what ends up happening quite a few times is if somebody transitions away from a, from a career in which they've already had a platform built, they might be a high level charismatic leader. They might be a very good presenter or a good communicator. That doesn't necessarily mean that you're a coach. Like this is a very, very specific credentialed science and practice that takes a lot of work. And, um, and so I, I actually take my education and my credentialing uh, in pedigree very seriously. Um, and so that's why it's like, it is different. It's different than just, you know, having a, having a big personality and a, in a, in a great charismatic nature to call yourself a coach. So let's, let's lean into that for a moment. What makes a coach? Well, you know, there's, there's a certain ability to where it's like, I think the, you know, there's these purity lines between a consultant of me showing up with a certain level of expertise and experience in me saying, you know what, I can consult you and I can give you advice to be able to help you break through that barrier that has value to it. Uh -huh. In fact, there's many times where you'll actually see me if, if you, if you're ever sitting in a session with me, I'll say, Hey, I'm going to take off my coach hat and put on my consultant hat because I think I might have something specifically for you. Uh -huh. A coach to where between um, between the, the different certifications that, that we utilize from, you know, from Enneagram to strength finders, to disc, to, uh, whatnot of, of taking a massive toolbox and working with a client over a specific period of time and helping them discover their best, uh, their best foot forward, their best version of themselves, and even their best systems and strategies that are specifically designed based on who that leader already is opposed to me influencing myself and, and putting myself over top of that person. So a okay. lot of strategic question asking, a lot of strategic um, problem solving coming along the way, but more times than not, it's because, because you, Michael, you're actually coming up with, with these solutions and I'm helping dig that gold out of you um, and help you put that fat, the path forward. Um, and then there's also that, that third level, which is a little bit more of the intimate side of things with when it comes to counseling. So between consultant, coach, and counselor, those are those are three specific things that have um they're 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 really really fine lines between the three categories mm -hmm. but there are very specific skill sets involved in order to make them work mm -hmm. yeah great that's that's interesting, interesting stuff um you know what michael i'm just realizing now that my microphone is not turned on i'm gonna do i'm gonna just swap my microphone live real quick here give me one second <laughs> yeah you bet does this sound better uh, it's 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 cleaner, but we didn't. You're, you're not losing any audio from from okay. from previous. Cool. All right. Um, good stuff. Uh, so let's let's talk about your 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 clients right now. Your practice. Who who are your clients? Who do you work with typically? Executives. Typically, yeah. yeah. Um, I I love that I work with I work with C level leaders and executive teams, mm -hmm. which then have implications for enterprise teams as well. So. Um, we reverse engineer this all the way back to the type of outcomes that we want to we want to uh, have happen for for a specific leader. More times than not, when it comes to an enterprise leader, it could be a it could be a large company, it could be a small company, mm -hmm. but somewhere along the way, um, that executive they're just feeling like their vision is getting stuck. Maybe they've just have that to where they can't see farther than they really want to. Mm -hmm. Maybe their vision is smaller than what they would like it to be. Um, so whoever tells the best story wins always. And so, mm -hmm. well, who tells the best story? It's always the teams that produce the greatest results that perform the best. I mean, so if you think about it, like I grew up in the, in the nineties, eighties and nineties, where it's like Chicago bulls, Michael Jordan, Scotty Pippen, absolute dominant forces with basketball. You have Mike Tyson, you know, knocking everybody's heads off within 30 seconds of him taking the ring, you know, um, these stories and these performers of teams, they're absolutely fantastic. And so we really like to be able to get into the nitty gritty of, okay, what is the actual scientific, but also the, um, the practical approaches of, of making great team dynamics and great chemistry come to life within high performing teams. Well, who's always leading these teams. It's always the leaders that lead with the highest levels of authenticity and transparency, great 
collaborative vision and compelling stories. Um, so, so, so working with, go ahead. So, so you keep, you keep mentioning stories. How does that play into this? Are you, are you saying that, that teams who, that leaders with teams where the leader tells the best stories and can, can kind of like create narratives to motivate the team? Is, is that the, the, the topic here? Or am I misunderstanding? Um, you're, you're getting part of it. Um, okay. the, a team that performs the best, there's, there's some sort of outcome, there's some sort of overflow that comes out of a well-performing team that mm -hmm. impacts the culture and the spaces that those teams occupy. So mm -hmm. when I'm thinking about like great organizations that I'm fans of, like, so I'm thinking about like the big famous, like the Starbucks, the, the Chick-fil-A's, the Apple right. computers, the, the people behind really in, incredibly compelling brands, those teams, they just have culture, their vision and their value just completely locked in like a science. Um, so it's the stories that are a byproduct of the, of, of a healthy team. Does okay. that make sense? I think so. Is, are you, is it, is it kind of, um, what's the word I'm looking for? Are you using story kind of interchangeably with like culture? Uh, culture and outcomes. You know, I think when it comes to, um, even with one of the, one of our products that we're getting ready to roll out over the next couple of months, it's this guest experience certification. Mm -hmm. It really is about the, the, a culture produces the story. The culture produces some sort of inter, interchange and in, in, in engagement with a client or a customer, um, per se. Yeah. And so, I mean, it could be anywhere from a retail location of, you know, somebody walk, going into a car dealership and, and wanting to buy a vehicle, but their engagement is so good. And it's such a, it's an, a great experience that uh -huh. now they have an amazing story to tell because of that. So I'm, you're I'm, almost, I'm over you're, you're almost talking about like building a brand, right? Like creating, like these are, these are brand experiences, right? It always comes down to brand experiences. Yeah. Always. But you, you have to, you have to reverse engineer that and understand that your team always comes before your brand. Now your brand can be aspirational, uh -huh. which it should be because your vision part por portions of your vision are aspirational. Sure. Um, but in order to get that whole thing to work and especially in executive coaching and team coaching, it always comes down to like, okay, great. How do I take a great leader that has a great vision, making sure that he's surrounding himself with a team that can actually take that vision and put it into, into flawless amazing execution that produces the brand that produces the stories that produces the engagement um we want fan culture but are we willing to pay the price are we willing to actually reverse engineer it down to the value systems that hold up our vision and our values right right so you asked the question how do you how do you build these 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 leaders that are able to lead these teams in such a way that that in their everyday interactions with customers right a brand is not built in house a brand is built through these customer interactions through any kind of marketing communications right and it's the brand is really built in the minds and the hearts of the market right the people who are interacting the customers who are interacting with that brand so how do you do that I love these questions, man. You are rocking it. This is so good. So, well, and I get to nerd out with you. So I, I appreciate this very much. I love so, branding. I love branding. It's, it's like my, my favorite thing. Well, then, okay. So you'll get this, right? So in, in, in 2020, uh, 2020 to 2021, in the, in the marketplace alone, organizations, companies, whatever, they spent $281 billion on what they continue to consider their external communication strategies or AKA marketing and brand strategies, hmm. $281 billion. These dollars were spent to try to make familiar the products and services that they're providing to people that were either unfamiliar or lightly familiar with the products and services that they were offering in the first place. Mm -hmm. That's a lot of money. Yeah. Now, <laughs> Now flip that all the way around to when we talk about team culture, only in comparison, only 1% of the same dollar amount was spent with internal communication strategies. So when you're asking me the question, okay, how do we make the brand and the stories all come to life? Mm -hmm. It literally is flipping the funnel around from your, you know, talking about your core to your community, to your crowd, to your city, flipping that all the way back around and making sure that you're prioritizing your internal communication strategy 
that takes that that centric vision and that centric why of understanding the compelling story behind the motivation behind the senior leader and making sure that the thing is felt all the way through their whole organization because if you can get fan culture to exist at entry levels of your organization you've already won half the battle does that make sense it totally does so i'm going to keep digging on this because i love this topic how do you make it felt high levels of well number number there's really two things the first thing that i'll tell you is where most people end up failing on this is that 2020 and 2021 in the middle of covid we found ourselves walking into this season of the great resignation right so it's like all of a sudden you've heard of this like in, in, you know unemployment rates highest they've ever been and people figuring out ways that um or just figuring out a way that the actual power paradigm within organizations it's no longer the employee uh that is uh waiting for somebody to call the shots mm -hmm. it's actually the other way around now it's literally the employer coming to terms with, okay, what does it take for us to actually attract the right employee? Mm -hmm. So during this great resignation, what we've realized is that EQ within an organization is now top priority. Mm -hmm. Like this is one of the biggest things that we'll talk about for the next decade within leadership is making sure that high levels of emotional intelligence are weaved within the fabric of your whole organization. The second thing is making sure that your internal communication strategy that between remote work culture and between your brick and mortar in person culture, that communication is no longer an accessory. Communication is absolutely a necessity. And as a senior leader, mm -hmm. um, it is it's up to you to reinvent how you're going to communicate and making sure that you, that your communication strategy internally is communicating high levels of emotional intelligence all the way out to your entry levels of your organization. Mm -hmm. If that isn't working, nothing's working. Mm -hmm. Yeah. 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 Okay. I like it. I like it. I, I can't, uh, I can't add anything to that. That's great. <laughs> That's great, Michael. Um, sweet. So uh, what does a typical engagement with, with you guys look like? Uh, it really, it's, it's, it's in those three specific kind of areas. So it's like, we have our, um, we have our one-on-one -on -one or our, or our, or our tribal type type of groups where you can get into a large group coaching program, or you can get into our one-on-one -on -one executive coaching programs to where you, your cadence can be set up anywhere from once a week to every week, um, with one of our coaches, uh, mm -hmm. or with myself, if, if that's, um, if you're a good fit for that. And, um, and then once a month you get an opportunity to uh, to work with me and your executive team to where I'll work directly with you and the people that report directly with you. And then once a quarter uh, at a level of enterprise engagement. So we either come to you or you can come on site to, to us and we'll do a team event for you. And making sure that all these things that we're talking about when it comes to internal communication strategies, culture, branding, everything, that we can help you fine tune everything and, and get it locked in and solid and, and performing really well. Nice. Nice. Um, let's get a little more into that. Do you want to talk uh, a little bit about the team's methodology? Yeah, let's do it. So um, within the team's methodology, we, well, first and foremost, I, I started working with an executive coach myself, probably about maybe about three or four years ago. And um, I stumbled upon a guy that just is a brilliant dude. Um, and now I have a couple executive coaches that 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 I personally hired. And so we've really spent a lot of time working on the team's methodology to make sure that it works. So um, the motivation behind the team's methodology really came from that we were finding that um, uh, traction in EOS systems within organizations were really, really popular right now. Yep. And, but in some situations, depending on the size of the team or even the competency level of the players that were on those teams, sometimes they just lacked the, um, the ability to implement really, really well. And so the team's methodology was just really birthed out of a way of like, how can we take some of these ideas that were inspired from bigger thinkers than who we are, people that are doing things at a much bigger level, but how can we take the best of the best ideas and bring them down into, into simple implementation to help people just simply move the needle and to create great wins along the way. So the team's methodology really consists of these five points. The number one is that every single week we identify a clear target for the week. Um, what does the T stand for? Targets. Mm -hmm. The second one is the three levels of engagement. So on a scale of one to 10, 
how well are we engaging with our audience on a scale of one to 10? How well am I engaging with my direct report? And number three, on a scale of one to 10, how well am I engaging with my peers, the people that serve in, uh, in lateral positions on my team? And then A, sense for action steps. So what's the one documented action step that we're moving towards our target for this week? Momentum is the M. Um, now, momentum, we talk about it just a little bit differently because a lot of leaders, we talk about, okay, what are some extra fuel that we can throw on the fire? What's some additional things that we can do to, to help speed things up a bit? That's not the way we do it. We really identify the things that aren't working. We ask the questions, okay, what are some things that you've identified that you can remove so you can go a little bit faster? And do you feel empowered to remove them first and foremost? And are you, do you have the ability to identify them mm -hmm. secondly? And then synergy is the last one is synergy is okay. What are you, when all the pieces are in the right, right place, when everything's performing well, what are we celebrating now and how are you rewarding yourself along the way? So that's kind of the team's methodology wrapped up. We have it all built into our app. We have a free app that's available that you can, you, you can download. Um, it's just the teams dot teams dot coach on in the app store. You can get right in there and start using that and uh, and start documenting your wins and your targets, your your action steps along the way, um, as well as going to our website and getting a getting the paper form of this, which people actually use that exact same outline. Uh, just last week, we found out we had seventy five different companies across the country just using the paper form to set up their team meetings, which was brilliant. I loved I loved that we got those reports back. Nice. Nice. So you mentioned earlier uh, about EOS and traction. Um, and you, you mentioned that businesses, there's a lot of businesses out there, uh, including my own that, that like it and that use it, but they're not necessarily good at implementing it. Are you guys uh, an EOS implementer? I know there's, there's, a, that's kind of a specific thing. And if you're not, then, then how are you leveraging? How are you leveraging the, the, the EOS system for what you guys are doing and how you're working with, with the businesses that you're working with. Yeah, absolutely. Well, there's, um, I think when you're, I'm not an EOS implementer, we work with several organizations that have EOS as part of their systems. Um, and so we help facilitate as much as we can when somebody already has systems like that in place. When I was in church ministry, uh, we actually utilized EOS uh, as part of our, as, as part of our church operational uh, system. And it was, it's brilliant. It's great. Yeah. Um, so when it comes to identifying, I think the things I love about, uh, about EOS is just the accountability of it. You know, it's like, here's, here's your VTO. Here's exactly what these meetings are going to look like. Here's your, here's your, uh, your little rocks. Here's your big rocks. Here's your weekly tasks. Here's who accountable. Here's your stories that you're telling along the way. So all those things are really, really good. What we found is that just when people want to, uh, when they're in development of certain things or if they just don't have the, the, the leadership acumen on their team to be able to do that, um, the team's methodology is just a little bit more of a simple way for them to be able to implement a couple of things uh, and still identify gotcha. the big rocks that we're working on. Gotcha. So the team's methodology is, is in essence, almost like a simplified, um, maybe a distilled version of, of, of EOS that's a little bit easier to, or maybe a little bit more approachable. I'll put it that way. Um, if you use it in that way, it will, it will work in that way. So uh -huh. if you use it in your team environment to where you want to use the team's methodology to, to push things along, yes, it's a little bit easier to understand. There's not a lot, there's, it's, it's certainly not even intended to be as robust as like 90.io or anything like that, right? Sure. This is intended to be a, just incredibly simple uh, project management and leadership vi uh, visionary deployment that is simple. However, the team's methodology is intended to be specifically an executive coaching platform. So I work with my leaders one-on-one -on -one and our calls literally just follow the team's methodology. Every single time that I'm meeting with somebody one-on-one, -on -one, um, I even had a client last week, you know, we, uh, there's a top golf right here in Omaha nice. and he loves to do re his recreational. He loves to do his coaching time during his recreation time, which I'm great with that. It's like, great, let's go hit some stuff, you know? So I, I, I'll pop over with my iPad. We'll go through his, his, his weekly team's methodology and we'll be talking, setting up his goals, talking about his targets, action steps, his big wins along the way. And, um, and it's something that to where once our clients start engaging with it, they just love it because it's, it rolls off the tip of their tongue really well. Nice. That's, that's great. That, that's, uh, that's good work if you can get it. 
<laughs> coaching, coaching at Top Golf, having a beer and, and swinging at some golf balls. <laughs> Why not? Why not? <laughs> I love it, man. Um, <clears throat> when you when you first started out, uh, what uh, sort of things did you struggle with, and how did you overcome those 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 barriers in your business? Yeah. Well. Um, coming out of pastoral ministry, one of the things that I was, that I had struggled with was that there's really two types of leadership systems that exist within the church world. And now keep in mind, I was, you know, I'd been in from being a musician to singer songwriter, being the music leader within the church and also being the number two for a couple decades. You know, you kind of you kind of lose lose sight a little bit with what leadership systems is, exist outside of the church. So you can come become very kind of quarantined in that environment. And one of the things that um, that was really standing out to me is that you have either like these nepotistic leadership environments to where everybody's super close and related to each other, and so you have expectations without accountability in some of those spaces. And if you're anything like me, like I'm a one on the Enneagram, I'm a type A personality and I want to keep things moving. I want to keep things, you know, getting results for the time that I'm putting into it. Um, or you have some organic um, infrastructure based uh, environments, which operate a little bit more like, like the business world. Um, getting started into this, um, some of the things that we, that we immediately bumped into was, um, was just scalability. Like how much, how much, you know, how can we find out how to get the best performance out of our time? What types yeah. of things do I need to adapt into my business to making sure that I'm attracting the right clientele? That's a perfect fit for me and what I do. Um, and then how do I really make sure that I make visible the things that I value that I value the most? I'm a firm believer that whatever we make visible is what we attract. So it's almost kind of like a fake it till you make it type of thing. Mm -hmm. um, but it only takes one really good experience or one really, really like great client for you to find out what your stride is and what it's going to take in order for you to get to the next level. And, um, and so I was pretty thankful. We had, we had some really big clients come on uh, because of through speaking engagements or whatnot. So it was a very organic launch for us. And then during COVID, because everybody had to figure out at the exact same time, literally the whole planet figured out, oh my, we also need to have a digital version of our business that is just as strong as our brick and mortar yeah. version of our business. And what a lucky blessing that I had, that I had a background, you know, to where we had an up and functioning creative and media team already working with, with us to where we were able to come alongside all these different organizations and nonprofits and churches and be able to help them develop their dual strategy. Um, it was, that was probably one of the biggest, the biggest blessings that we had. And even just during that season. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's great. That's great. Tell us, tell us, uh, some more, about some, tell us about some big wins that you've had. Uh, big wins. So I would say the things that we're working on right now, um, so we were just finishing up, like probably, I think probably we're on our, our 30th podcast uh, that we're experiencing right now of just doing a little bit more podcast influencing. So that's been amazing that it's been an organic reach uh, of people reaching out to us. Um, some of our biggest, uh, biggest wins is, was that we've had uh, one of our businesses last year, they reached out to us when they were actually reaching out to uh, the federal government to get operational loans uh, in order for them to stay in business in 2018 and 2019 this is a business that was doing basically a four million dollar profit run year over year and they were heading into a four hundred thousand uh, dollar negative cash operational flow in the middle of 2020 and they decided to bring us on and that we've had a full 1.2 million dollar flip with that company by making strategic changes to what they're doing with their business and how they're approaching it so that's huge um, we've taken a startup out of a, a tile and floor company out of Colorado Springs, which is a completely unique space for us to be in. You wouldn't think that an executive coaching firm would be working with a tile and floor company, but we tell their stories all over our social consistently just because, I mean, here are these, these guys that literally have built this brand around this um, concierge level service providing that they do within the tile and floor industry. Mm -hmm. And it's a, 
And they have done such a great job just running in the plays, making sure that their brand is slick and consistent and they're creating this, um, this high level emotional type experience with their clients to where their clients actually turn into their best storytellers. Mm -hmm. And, um, and those guys are, have literally grown probably 400% year over year since we've been working with them over the last three years. Nice. And it's been phenomenal. That's great. What recommendations would you have for new coaches? Um, be authentic, um, be transparent, um, be real. Um, I, one of the things that, you know, that I, I was told earlier on is that you should never trust a coach that doesn't have a coach. So, you know, I think by leading yourself well and making sure that teachability and humility are the number one things that are kind of being the kind of like the true North of your own life, uh -huh. you're going to attract the right people to be able to work with. Um, it's not always about the big swings. It's not always about the massive stories. It's, get it's a little hits. bit more. <laughs> What's that? You got to get those base hits. You really do. And I think, again, it's, you know, we started off the conversation saying, you know, how did, how did I get into coaching? Well, I, I mean, this is that I don't think that you actually choose coaching. I think coaching kind of chooses you and understanding how to use that organic influence that you already have and mm -hmm. try to not have, you know, try not to always want for things that aren't your supposed to be yours in the first place but organically be yourself and lead in levels of humility and, and authenticity and the right leaders are going to come your way that you're going to want to work with. Love it. That's great, man. Um, Michael, this has been great, man. Is there anything that you would <laughs> like to chat about that we haven't touched upon? I, you know, I came in here with kind of like just an open, open mind and uh, not really necessarily knowing uh, the, all these things are just a little bit different. You never quite exactly know where they're going to go, but yeah. you know, we've went down the path of some really cool branding. We've went down the ideas of, of a couple different things. I have some interesting thoughts on like feedback me mechanisms within the organization. So if you ever want to chat about 360 reviews and why sometimes they don't necessarily always work out the best they can, we can talk about those things at some point as well. Let's, let's do that right now. And like most, I would say the vast majority of guests that I have on this podcast love 360 degree assessments because you get, you know, you get, you get in theory, um, you know, true, honest feedback from above, from below and from peers. So what you, you've got some, some other thoughts on, on those. I'm curious to, to know what you think about that. Yeah, when they're executed really well and when they're executed rightly with the right people, 360 re reviews can be one of the most powerful utilities that you'll ever use. Um, and, but again, do you actually have all the right components in place to navigate these really well? Um, what we found out along the way is, is that the majority of over 7,000 different uh, different employees surveyed over the last seven years is that the highest the highest valuable feedback that we've ever gotten back has been what a team member actually feels of their of their senior leader not necessarily what the senior leader thinks about the the team member mm -hmm. um where we've seen things go wrong on these is that if they're not implemented by a third party with absolute impartial uh motivations sure. then uh they end up they end up going south really really fast um the 360 oh, review can, can you give an example of that of how it would go oh yeah absolutely number one is if you if you are if if you are conducting a 360 review yourself um it's absolutely 100 percent important that you don't come up with your own evaluative questions on your own mm -hmm. you need to make sure that you're using um, either templated services or to have a, 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 an impartial person be able to help you come up with the right questions to ask. The 360 review, it needs to have valuable questions asked that wow. have no biases. That tracks. Absolutely. And so this is the number one thing where we see the 360 fail was that um, a senior leader or somebody within an organization they're feeling like their, their gut might tell them something's off within their culture or a KPI might be off in a specific area of performance of the team. So they'll come up with their own questions to find out 
But the problem is, is that asking questions is one of the hardest things to do within an organization when it comes to evaluating things. Mm -hmm. So you need to make sure that you're bringing in experts in, in or to have something that's created that's a constant uh, source of, of value um, to where there's a consistency level across the board so you can evaluate fairly. Um, the 360 review, I mean, the history of this thing is just absolutely interesting is that it was first put into play uh, in World War II by the, uh, by the German army. Mm -hmm. And this thing was, was created out of the space of how, to, how can the German army really evaluate the, the performance of their senior leaders. And so from there, the template really hasn't changed that much. And then it came into the 50s and 60s and started to get some traction within, within uh, the enterprise space. Mm -hmm. um, I like how some of the developments and some of the updates have been taking place to it as well. But now we have so many other options that are available within technology spaces and some different evaluative tools to where you the 360, it's not, it's not horrible, but you do need to make sure that you're implementing it right and that you have third-party interaction in order for you to get the most fair and accurate data possible. Right, because the key, the, the whole thing is useless if you're not getting honest and transparent feedback both from from seniors, subordinates, and peers, right? From everybody, from the whole 360 degrees. If if you don't have, and I think maybe this is, I think this is what you're saying, right? Where if you don't have, if I go to a subordinate and say, here, fill this out, tell me what you think about me. That's not going to work. It's just not, <laughs> right? Well, and I think that, yeah, exactly. I mean, and I, and I even just challenge you on this today, throw this out on Twitter, throw it out on social, but when you mentioned the idea of three, you know, like, hey, I'm going to do a 360 degree review within my organization. The majority of the people that we bump into, they actually, there's a little bit of a fear bias on it because they don't necessarily trust the delivery mechanisms and the, not the uh, anonymity yeah. of the data and the feedback that's given. And 2022, that's not going to work. Yeah. You know, like these things have to, you know, here, this is a, is actually a legitimate good practice as long as you execute it well. Um, and that's, and that unfortunately is really the, the question at play. Are we able to execute it well? And do we actually have the right resources at play for us to get fair and accurate data? Yeah, I dig it. I dig it. Um, circle back to branding real quick. Do you have a favorite book on, on branding that you, that you love, that you follow, that you use as maybe a guideline for yourself? You know, because we talk about stories so much, of course, I'm going to say story brand with Donald Miller. I think that is just absolutely great. Um, but I mean, anything that's, I mean, there's, there's, there's multiple different, you know, things that are out there, but I think when it, or, you know, anything by Seth Godin too, I mean, in, in the branding world is, is brilliant. Um, but I think along the, along that spaces of, of really def defining the, with the clients that we work with and, making sure that you're developing a compelling story in which that just continues to replicate energy and continues to push your brand farther. I'm a big fan of, of, of developing your story brand. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's uh, we, we use story branding as a methodology for our clients as well. Um, it just, it, it just works. I mean, that's all there is to it. <laughs> Especially it's just because I think, um, you know, I, when I was on staff, you know, with, you know, I, I went from working in, in the church world to being in the finance world and then working in the automotive industry while I was finishing out my master's. And one of the things that I used to hate was just, I, I just hated social media. I, every time that it came up as a staff meeting talking about, you know, somebody was coming up and saying, we have to do this on social. I was just like, dear God, this is horrible. I hate this. Well, part of the reason why I hate this is because every time that I log into Facebook, it feels like, or even if, even now it's like LinkedIn, it's like, how many times am I going to get into my inbox? Somebody that's literally just direct messaging me 35 different ways that if I sign up for their program, that I can have lead generation, that's 10,000 times more powerful than it was before. Yeah. And, and for me, I kind of come from that space of like, you know what, i really want to serve our audience well. I really want more things for you than I want things from you. And we live that. And I think story branding, I think that does that really well. Like if you have a compelling story of authentic transformational experiences, then you have nothing to worry about. 
But if it's fabricated and you, it's people feel like they're constantly in a click funnel or a sales pitch, you're going to lose credibility faster than you can keep up. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I don't know how many prospects that I talk to and even clients sometimes where we're not in charge of their branding and messaging. You know, you go to their website and it's we do this. Um, you know, we have this certification. We won this award. We do that. And not, not, not a thing about our clients, you, you know what I mean? Like on the homepage of their website, it, it's so, so, so common. If, if the word I appears on your website more than the word you, there's a problem. I love that. That is, that's, that's, that's amazing. That's brilliant. That's, and that's just, that's just like that story brand distilled, right? If you distill yeah, story, absolutely. Brand, if, if the word I is on your homepage more than the word you, because you should be talking about your clients, then, then you got to reconsider your copy. Oh man. And that's probably one of the biggest mistakes that we see that we see organizations making consistently. Mm -hmm. um, and there's just, there's somebody else that's always significantly more famous than you are. You just don't know it yet, but there isn't somebody that is more important than the client that has the great story. Right. And that's a, that's a big, that's a big kind of true North for us. Yeah. I love it. I love it. Um, cool, man. Before we wrap up, I'm going to throw, I'm going to throw a book out here that I love that you may not be familiar with 60 minute brand strategist by Idris Muti. I love it. It's brilliant. Awesome. I have not heard that, but I, I'll, I'll check that out. It's brilliant. It's a 60 minute read. It's very quick and easy. Um, it's, it's a, you know, it's a 30,000 foot view. It's definitely not as you're not going to walk away with a, a framework like you will from story brand but the way that he distills what a brand is and how to strategize something like Nike or Apple or Procter and Gamble products. It, it's just it, a little bit kind of blows your mind. It's, it's, it's a good one. I, I, I think you would like it. I think you'd dig it. Oh, I love it. That yeah. is so cool, man. Thank you so much for that. Yeah, you bet. Uh, Michael King. Thank you so much for joining us on the Remarkable Coach podcast. Your website is www.teams.coach. Where else can our viewers and listeners connect with you online? Uh, you can find me on all social. So under Michael King, uh, under, under Facebook or teams.coach under Facebook, also teams.coach on Instagram and uh, Michael King Jr. on LinkedIn. So Beauty. Thank you, brother. I appreciate your time. Thank you so much. Take care and thank you to our viewers and listeners. We'll see you guys next time. Cheers.